All right, so in James chapter 2, a very famous passage, especially among people who want to try to teach a works-based salvation. Now, this isn't the focus of my sermon this morning. Uh, I mean, salvation is, but not, not the works-based part or not trying to refute all of the, um, you know, the, the things that you might hear somebody try to say. Anyone that wants to try to tell you that, no, no, faith isn't enough, you have to you have to do something else. You have to obey the commandments. You have to do this. You have to do that. You have to be baptized. You have, you know, whatever they might try to say, they're always going to turn to James chapter 2. So I want to throw just a few things out since we're here in James chapter 2. We're starting off here. Even though it's not the main content of the sermon, at, whenever I go through this, I'd like to be able to just point out a few things because I've heard it all before. And if you're not very strong or very solid in your faith, it might be easier for somebody to come and try to upset you or, or to try to shake your faith. Now, my first point is that you can read through all the New Testament and, and really the entire Bible. What you're going to find is a theme of faith for salvation. I mean, you're going to find verse after verse after verse after verse. You know, we all, I like to turn people to Acts chapter 16. A man says, sure, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. But Jesus said, you know, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And we could go on and on and on. I could spend just, just countless minutes here quoting verses that have to do with our salvation being based on believing or faith, right? For by grace you save through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you could go on and on and on and on and on. And I encourage you to, when you study James chapter 2, to study it in the context of what is also being referenced here, because when it says faith without works is dead, it brings up Abraham as being an example of having faith and works. Well, go to Romans chapter 4, because it talks about the same thing, and it says that, that Abraham, it says, if Abraham were justified by his works, he hath were of the glory. If, if it was because of his good deeds, it was because of his actions, then he can glory about that. Right? You, you have the ability to brag or to glory about all the things that you actually do. That makes sense, right? If you're putting forth work, you could, hey, you've earned it or you've worked for it. You, you can brag about that. You can boast about that. You can glory over that. But the Bible says in Romans chapter 4, it says, If Abraham were justified, if Abraham were justified by his works, he hath the word of the glory, but not before God. See, we can glory before other people. Because you might be able to do more works than someone else or whatever, but we can't glory before a holy, perfect, sinless God. Why? Because we're sinners. Because we've already broken God's law. We've transgressed. The Bible says that all of our righteousnesses are like as filthy rags to God. Because whatever, however good we think we are, we don't come close to measuring up to God's standard or to God. So we have no room to glory before a holy God. Because we're just sinners that need a Savior. We need to be saved. Jesus paid the whole way. You know, it, it's very simple. And I, and I know, look, I'm preaching to the saved this morning. I get that. But I don't want you to be shaken when some Mormon or Jehovah's Witness or just some other apostate comes up to you and says, well, don't you know you have to have works? I mean, faith just can't save you. I'm going to make a couple points about James chapter 2. First of all, I find it interesting that God chose as, you know, when he's given us his words, within chapter 2 here, verse number 10 says, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. I mean, whenever you're going to have a work salvation is try to, to go to James 2, they're never going to point that verse out to you because it doesn't fit with their doctrine, right? How could it? Look, if, if you just sin in one place, the Bible saying, look, you're guilty of everything. So how could your work save you if you're already guilty of all? That doesn't make any sense. But the other thing they do is they point to things that are literally put in here as a question or as statements that are not necessarily extremely clear or explicit. Because this is not explicitly just saying that if you don't have any works and you're not saved, it's not explicitly saying that you must have works in order to be saved. It doesn't say that. So it asks a question. It says right here, um, 
And this gives more of the context too. And this is what I'm going to be focusing on. Verse number 14 says, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Now, is that a statement? Does that say faith does not save people? It doesn't say that. He's asking a question. And then later on, you're going to see in verse 24, it says, You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. There's a point being made in James chapter 2 that is not referring to the salvation of a person's soul. He's talking to people here in the whole book of James, but earlier in chapter 2, he's kind of calling them out for being respecters of persons, right? Saying, hey, if someone comes into you and they're rich and they have all these fancy clothes on and stuff, and you're just giving all this respect unto that person because they're rich, but then you go and like a poor person comes in and you're like, oh yeah, you, you, standing room only for you, buddy, or come over here, you could sit under my footstool, you know, and you treat people that way. He's like, there's a fault there. There's a problem with that because that's not how you're supposed to deal with people. And he's dealing with, with, with a Christianity here. The, the audience has an issue. They have problems. So another one of the problems is that they're not doing works. They're not doing anything to profit anybody else. We see here, because he, he, when he continues on, in verse number 15 there, the Bible says, If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? You say, and someone comes to you, they're, they're in need. They, they're hungry and they're cold. They don't have any clothing. And they're saying, hey, can you help me out? And they said, yep. Be warm. Be filled, right? God bless you. Abundantly. I hope you have lots of clothes and lots of food. See you later. You didn't do anything to help that person, right? It may sound really good. It, it could sound great to someone just hearing you, hearing your words. You can glory of how nice you were to that person, but you didn't really do anything to help them. It didn't profit that person at all. And, and the point he's getting across here in this chapter is saying, you know, people can say all day long, Oh, I'm a Christian. Oh, I have faith. I have this, I have that. But when you're not actually doing anything, what does it profit? What does it profit anyone? For you to just say these things and not do anything. Okay, Th this is the point of what he's saying here in James chapter 2. What good would it be? And, and, and he uses a very extreme example, I think, with Abraham, with, with how his faith was tried or tested because he brings up, and Abraham's a great example. Now, Abraham believed God a long time earlier than when he went to offer up his son Isaac, right? Abraham believed God when God told him, hey, I'm going to make a multitude out of you. Your seed, seed is going to be like the sand by the seashore. You're going to be blessed. There's going to be multitudes of nations that come out from you, you know, all this stuff, when he didn't have a child. When Sarah was barren, when her womb was shut, he believed God back then. He trusted that God would give him a child. Later on, Sarah finally did have that child, right? When she was like 90 years old, she had a child. That same child then that was promised of God, the, the promise was still made that he was going to have this multitude from that promised seed of Isaac. So when God asked him to kill, to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice, which is obviously very symbolic of Jesus Christ. You could see the type there in, in, of Jesus Christ through Isaac, but um, I'm not going to get into all that this morning. When he asked him to do that, to offer up his son Isaac, that was a big deal. But see, we learn from Hebrews uh, chapter 11, it says that, you know, he knew that God was able to raise him even from the dead. So he didn't lapse in his faith because he knows that when God makes a promise, it's true and it will stand. So if God is asking him to do something like kill his child, he can't go back on the promise he already made to bless him and make a multitude of nations. So he knew that, you know, whatever God does, 
He's going to be able to bring my son back. He's going to still be able to make good on my promises. So going forward with what God is commanding him to do, you know, it tested his faith, but it, it demonstrated that he really did believe that his, his faith was genuine because he was willing to go through with whatever God told him since he already believed the promises. Now, in order for the work salvationist to be correct here, like if that, if that were, if what they were saying is true, that, oh no, we need to have these works. Abraham needed to do all this stuff or else he wasn't saved. Does that mean he just got saved when he went to offer up his son Isaac? And, you know, I mean, that doesn't make any sense at all. Is that when, is that when Abraham got saved, when he went and, and actually performed the works? No, of course it's not. He got saved way, way back earlier in his life when he believed God. God called him out of Haran unto a place that he didn't know, unto a strange land, and he was a sojourner in, and he didn't even inherit that land. God just called him out of his homeland to go and to the land of Canaan and, and, you know, and stay there. He was living in tents and living in a foreign land. He believed God way back then. He believed God when God promised him a child. He believed God way earlier on. And it's clear from the mountains of Scripture all over the place that say, you know, especially in Romans 4 and other places, you could see Abraham's faith that saved his soul was just that. It was faith. And that matches up perfectly with everything else in the Bible. But what was being done here, what was being demonstrated was that Abraham didn't just have like a shallow faith or just a faith that where he said something words, but he didn't actually believe it. He actually did believe it. And he showed that, or he demonstrated that through his works. Okay. Now, once you get saved by putting your faith in Jesus Christ, you still have choices to make. And hopefully you will make choices based on your faith. Right? I'm going to choose to read my Bible and go to church and pray and just do these other things because my faith is in Christ. Right? That would make sense. That's going to keep your faith alive and active. Now, another thing that this doesn't say here, you notice it says that uh, in verse 20, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. And in verse 26, it says basically the same thing. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. And that's a statement. And you know what? I believe that statement 100% be true. Amen. Faith without works is dead. Your faith dies when you don't have works. But does that say that your eternal life becomes temporary and stops at that point because your faith has died? It doesn't say that. Can we just automatically conclude that? Of course not. John 5, 24, Jesus Christ said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth unto him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. It's happened. It's done. You're sealed. You're secure. You're saved. But as a believer, if, if, you know, once you've been born into God's family, you're born again. That doesn't change. But your faith can die when you stop doing any works for God. Obviously, we don't want that to happen. Your faith can die. It doesn't mean that your new spirit dies. But your faith can die. And the way that it dies is by not doing any works. And when you're not doing any works, what does that profit anyone? It doesn't profit anyone a thing. So you can tell people all day long when you're doing no works, well, oh, I'm a believer. I have faith in God. What good does that do to, everyone, to anyone else? It doesn't help anyone a thing. And that's the point being made here. That's why it says also in here, um, where it says, Yea, a man may say, verse number 18, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Right? And, and that's how you ought to be showing people your faith, is through your works. You know, don't... It, don't go telling people you have this great faith and you don't do anything for God, right? Because that's, you don't. You really don't. Faith is, is something that's unseen. You know, when people take a, a step of faith, they're doing something because they trust what God's word said, but they're doing something, right? When you take a step of faith, when you go a walk of faith, we're actually doing something based on what this book says, something that you don't see, but it's something that you believe and you trust in, so you're going to actually move forward on it. Now, 
All of that being said, I'm segueing into what, the, what the, the sermon, the subject matter is about this morning. And turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're just finishing up the month of January. And last year, we did a series of various uh, challenges. And we're doing the same thing this year. I think they're great. I love these challenges. I think they're a great boost. I think they help to get us back on track. If there's an area where we're struggling with, if there's an area that we're not doing very well in, if there's an area that, that needs improvement, well, these challenges will help you to get back on course. January, the challenge was to read the entire New Testament in the 31 days of January. Great challenge. Maybe your Bible reading has been lacking. Well, you know what? That's going to give you an extra boost to say, you know what? I really need to make time to do this. This is important. If nothing else, I'm going to make sure, you know, the, the year's starting off great and my New Testament's going to be read one time all the way through in the very first month. What a great start to the year. That's why we're doing it in January. It's a great way to start the year. You got God's word. Hopefully you have the whole New Testament done. And as I mentioned before, I'm going to mention this with all of our challenges. If you fall short, but the challenge has made you read even more, then it's still a very good thing, okay? If you get the New Testament read, well, I didn't finish it in January, but I finished it by mid-February or whatever, great. Hey, praise God. If you're doing more than you have been and you're kind of pushing yourself to do more, very good. That's the point of the challenge. I want to make sure that the spirit of our challenges is, is clearly known because... The next challenge that starts up on February 1 is our soul winning challenge. We did this last year. We're doing it again this year. And the challenge is to, try, to attempt to give at least one person the gospel every single day in the month of February. Now, the point of this and the goal of this is to make us thinking more regularly about the need, the necessity of giving the gospel to the lost because it is a mindset. And I can't tell you how many times in my life I have blown opportunities to give the gospel to people simply because I wasn't even thinking about it. And that's a shame Shame on me as a believer to have a great opportunity, maybe with someone that I know, a family, a friend, whoever. And I have the perfect opportunity and the thought never even crosses my mind. Even though they're lost, even though they're on their way to hell, just we talk about whatever, everything else under the sun. And I never once even bring up salvation. And you know what? I don't ever want that to happen again to me. And I don't want that to happen again to you either. So the, the goal of this is to be thinking. And, and, you know, I did this last year. and It's not the easiest of challenges. I'll tell you that much because I had to make it a point. You know, there's, there's certain days where I'm working from my office at home where I don't even leave the house. But for the challenge, guess what? I leave the house. <laughs> go out and find somebody to attempt to give the gospel to because it is that important. And, but the, the point, though, is that if you're thinking about this, if you're thinking about it through the month of February, then that should carry over to be thinking about it just throughout the rest of the year. And I'll go places like gas stations, Walmart, whatever. I mean, if it's late in the evening, we've got a 24-hour Walmart. There's somebody there, especially when it's really slow and no one's doing anything because there's hardly anyone even there that you can strike up a conversation to. And now the, the thing is with this challenge too that makes it a little bit easier is you don't have to get somebody saved every day. I mean, that would be probably close to impossible here. You'd have to be spending all day just, just going out and trying to talk to people. All you have to do is just approach someone and, and you know what? If they're not interested, you've met the, the, the criteria for our challenge. If they say, yeah, no, thanks. I'm really, you know, I don't want Okay, fine. Obviously the goal is we want to we try to get people to, to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ, but for, for, the, for the point of this is to, one, yeah, lead more people to Christ, but two, have that part of our mindset of thinking, this is really important. There are people all around me on a daily basis that are probably going to go to hell when they die. And if you don't say something to that person, 
How do you know that anyone else will? You don't. And what a shame that would be for you to have this knowledge, to know about this free gift, to know how easy it is, to know that we have a Savior, to know that God loves people, and, and someone can receive that now. Someone can receive that today. Someone can just receive that gift if they would listen and hear and accept what Christ did for them. It's not difficult on their part to receive a free gift. It's not at all. The work comes in on your part to decide, hey, I love people, I care about people, and I'm going to show them how they can receive this free gift that I already have. I had you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to start reading in verse number 1. Because we want to remember, you know what, faith without works is dead. And I don't want anyone's faith here to be dead. We need to have the works. We need to be going out, not so that our soul is saved, but that we can help get other people's souls saved. Because what does it profit? What does it profit anybody else that you have faith in Jesus Christ? Why don't you ask yourself, ask yourself that this morning? Hey, it profits you because you're going to heaven when you die. Amen. But what does it profit anyone else? What does your faith profit to anybody else? If you're not giving the gospel to people... I don't see how that's profiting anybody else. I really don't. But let's keep going here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, and a ministry is a work. You're ministering to other people. As we have received mercy, we faint not. Now, why is he bringing up the fact that we don't faint? Because fainting is talking about when you're working, working, working until you're exhausted and you faint. But he's saying we don't faint. Because they're working. It's a ministry. They're working. We don't faint. Verse number two, we have, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Very important when we're giving the gospel to people, we're not trying to trick them. We're not trying to pull verses out of context. and you know, No. We're, we're just showing them God's word. And, and when we go sowing, that's why we bring our Bibles just, I mean, whatever context is needed, let's, let's read it all. And you shouldn't be afraid if someone says, well, hey, let's read that in context. Yes, let's read it in context. Let's get the whole thing because we're not trying to deceive. We're not trying to handle God's word deceitfully and try to, you know, there's plenty of people out there that do that. Mormons. <laughs> Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah, they do that. They use the word, they handle the word of God deceitfully. Absolutely they do. But that's not what we're about. It's just the truth. It's just God's word. We're going to bring that to people and let's do that. Renounce the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in crafty, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Verse number three. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. If you hide the gospel, if you don't share that with anyone, that doesn't affect you. You're still going to heaven. But it's hid to them that are lost. And that's a great damage unto them because, like I said earlier, you know, how are they going to get saved? Someone, you're going to have to just rely on someone else doing the work. Well, guess what? If everyone had that attitude, then no one would be getting the work done. You can't just assume that other people are going to do it. And I'll tell you this too. When people come and visit our church, don't just assume, hey, Pastor Burson is going to go and talk to that person. Don't assume that. Now, I'm going to do my best to try to make sure I talk to everyone that comes in and make sure that they're saved, you know, especially when we have people come in. It's really important. That's great. But don't assume that anyone else is going to do the work. Take it upon yourself to go out and, and, and roll up your sleeves and do what God has commanded all of us to do, not just the pastor, but everybody. Verse number four, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. See, Satan has blinded the eyes of the people. That are lost. I mean, everyone's lost. They're, they are blinded. And that's why it is so important to bring the light. God's word, the gospel, the light to shine through and to penetrate and to pierce that darkness and to give them that understanding. But we need to bring that light source. We need to bring it with us to the people. It's not, it doesn't just happen all on its own. The Bible says that God has committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation, of reconciling sinners to God, of, of making, helping to, uh, to um, 
get them to receive Christ so that they could be reconciled through, through Jesus Christ's blood. Um, verse number five, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Jump down, if you would, now to verse number 15. Because again, I, I think <clears throat> one of the, the reasons why people don't preach the gospel very much, there's multiple reasons. Sometimes they're scared. Sometimes they just think it's just too much work, whatever. But we're going to see this attitude of being able to work. Verse number 15, For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. There's again a reference to not fainting, not, not failing, not, not just passing out, right? For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. So even though your outward man may you know, experience the, the fatigue Right? You go out, so you go knocking on doors and your legs start to get tired and you start to get tired and you feel weary and worn out. Yet the inward man, the inward man is renewed day by day. And that's your spirit. Your, your spirit can be doing great and, and is actually strengthened by doing this work, even though your outward man perishes. Verse number 17 For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And, and this is the attitude we need to have. Look, it's a light affliction. It's not that big of a deal. It's not some huge task that's just, you know, way overwhelming and overburdening and I can't do this. I'm not strong enough. No, it's a light affliction and it's only going to last a short period of time because our life is like a vapor. We're here one day, we're gone the next. We have a short period of time, so let's use that time. It's a light affliction and the, the rewards that God will give you for actually doing the work is going to be beyond measure in comparison to the actual work that you do. And what an amazing God, right? What, what a gracious God. How, how awesome is that to even think that, wow, God's not just going to pay me like, you know, okay, well, you just did this light work, this light affliction, so I'm just going to give you, a, you know, a little bit for that. No, he's going to, he, he multiplies the blessings and the payment to us. And, and does he have to do that? No, but he does. What a great incentive. And we should have that faith of not just be so concerned about the things which are seen. Because the Bible says, you know, things that are seen, that's temporary. It's temporal. So you can get so focused on, yeah, but if I, if I spend this time at the soul winning times and I go out, then I don't have enough time to go earn money. I don't have enough time to go do this, go do that. And, and you're worried about all the things that you can see in this earth and you can just see the physical objects and they're all going to be gone. And it's going to be nothing. You're going to find out that, wow, I spent all of this time on something that's ultimately just vanity. On this house, on this property, on this whatever. Because it's all going to be burned up and gone. And if I would have just spent my time, you know, on other, focus on other things, focus on other people, focus on giving the gospel to people, hey, that lasts forever. What God's going to end up giving me at the judgment seat of Christ, that is eternal. But see, we don't, we don't see with our eyes the judgment of Christ right now. So it's easier to just forget about those things. It's easier to get wrapped up in every other aspect of your life that's going on, which is why we need a continual reminder. It's why Bible reading is so important. It helps to give you that continual reminder. Stay in the Word to, to just remind yourself, yeah, you know what, this is important. Yeah, no, I really need to be doing this because I'm distracted with everything else that's going on in the world that's just temporary. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 17. I want you to see that. I'm going to read for you from Colossians chapter 1. You're turning to Acts 17. I'm going to read for you from Colossians 1, verse number 23. The Bible says, If you continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister... Paul is claiming here in the word of God that the gospel was preached to every creature which is under heaven. What a, 
how do you think a statement like that can even be made? What type of person was the Apostle Paul to be able to make a statement that the gospel was preached to every creature under heaven and to say that confidently and boldly? Well, we're going to see in Acts chapter 17, because of the type of person that the Apostle Paul was, which is, does not have to be unique to the Apostle Paul. Look, this is how I want us to be. This is how I want you to be. This is how we all ought to be under, you know, under God's heaven. To be able to say, yeah, you know what? The gospel was preached to every creature. How about this? The gospel was preached to every creature in Prescott Valley. The, the gospel was preached to every creature in Prescott. The gospel was preached to every creature in Dewey and Humboldt and Chino and Mayer and everywhere in our area. How would we be able to say that if we're actually doing the work and going out and doing it? That's the only way. Now, we know the Apostle Paul was doing these things. Acts 17, verse number 16, provides a great example of this. You get a little bit to, in the insight of his character. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred. So Paul is in Athens. He's in Greece. He's waiting for his other fellow travelers to meet up with him. So he's just kind of hanging out until they get there, right? This is the story. And while he waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. So he's in there and he's like, man, these people are just super idolatrous. Everywhere I go, there's just these statues and these false gods. Verse number 17, therefore, so because his spirit was stirred, therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. His spirit was stirred. Is your spirit stirred? Is your spirit stirred? Now, you might not see all of the idolatry that he saw in Athens, right? But is your spirit stirred when you go to the grocery store, when you go here, when you go to the marketplace, when you go anywhere and you're surrounded with a bunch of people that you could pretty much fairly well assume are not believers and going to hell? That's the goal of our challenge. I want your spirit to be stirred. I want, if your character is not like the character of Paul's, let's change that. You can change. You can, you can make things different in your life if you want them to be. If you're not a soul winner now, if you're kind of shy, if you have any other things that might be holding you back, you can change those things. I'm a, God changes those things. Look, this is, God, is it God's will that any should perish? Is it God's will that any should perish? No. The Bible says no. Of course not. So if, if God's will is not that any should perish, and his will is that we should go out and preach the gospel to every creature, because isn't that what Jesus Christ said as a part of the Great Commission at the end of Mark chapter 16? Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Then anything that could be holding you back from doing so, don't you think God would work with you to overcome those things? And wouldn't he want you to overcome those things in order to do the work that he wants to have done? Of course he would. I hesitate sometimes in, in using myself as an example with things because I don't want to make it sound like, like I'm glorying of myself or lifting myself up at all. But just for those of you who don't know me or haven't known me very well, and especially you know, most people have just met me after I've become a pastor and things like that, but I was not always the way that I am today, especially when it comes to being able to speak in public at all or go up and approach a stranger and talk to them. I've never been comfortable with that up until I decided to change and do and try to fill a role that I know that God wants to have filled. And I'm not going to take credit for, for, for the changes that were made. I'm going to give that, that credit to God for, for helping me to overcome all those things but it does have to start with you making the choice. You see, by trade, I'm a computer programmer. I'm kind of a nerd in that way and have, have growing up, have been a lot more introverted. Never had the big groups of friends. Didn't like being the center of attention. Like to just kind of hang back, listen, and not really say a whole lot. That's how I've been. That was my personality and my character. But when I got into a church, that taught God's word, and I can see the I could see, yeah, this is this is this needs to be done. Then I had to make a choice and say, Am I gonna do God's will? Am I gonna help to 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 try to, to bring other people to Christ? Because I was saved. Hey, thank God that someone else wasn't like me 
and actually opened up their mouth and was able to preach the gospel. I thank God for that person. So seeing, I mean, whatever it is, whatever it is that, that really hits home to you, there's so many, there's so many things. <laughs> it could be the rewards. Hey, that's a great incentive. Yeah, do it for the rewards in heaven. Do it because you don't want to see this person going to hell. Do it because, you know, out of love for other people, out of love for God, out of fear of God. There's so many reasons. So many reasons. Pick one. Pick two. Pick three. Right? Pick one. Let's go with it. When I decided, yeah, you know what? This is important. I had to force myself to go out. But here's the good thing. It, we, we try to make it easy on you. We try to, to, to let God work in you and those changes come about. It doesn't have to happen immediately overnight Where you know, because it, it definitely didn't happen with me this way. Just, well, I'm going to go do this and I just automatically started knocking on doors and preaching the gospel with all boldness. No, no, that's not the way it worked. When I decided to go out soul winning, here's what I did. I became a silent partner. You can build up the boldness to go out and do these things. And you know what? That, for me, that took a lot of courage within myself to just be able to say, I'll go and do this. Looking back, I, I could see a lot more clearly where the Bible says that's a light affliction because the fears or whatever the problem is that you have to overcome, you magnify those things in your own mind. It really isn't that big of a deal. Me going out to, to, to accompany somebody else to walk up to somebody's house and knock on the door was way more scary in my mind than it is in reality. <laughs> so let, let that, you know, if, if you have that type of personality, just kind of let that sink in because, and I challenge you to just go out and prove me wrong. Prove to me why it is so scary. Why your, your fears are so justified. Go with somebody and, and, and let them knock on the door and attempt to give the gospel to somebody and see, and see how it goes. I, I would bet that it worked out the same way it did with me. That after a while of doing that, it becomes to be not so weird, not so scary. And after a while, you end up stopping to hope that nobody comes to the door. <laughs> I remember when I first came out, it was, it was, man, I hope nobody answers this door just because it's a, you know, it's a confrontation or whatever. You don't want to deal with that. But after a while, now, now it should be to the point to where, man, I hope this person's home. Man, I want to give them the gospel. Man, I want to get this person saved. That's where we want to end up. But not everyone starts there. But we need to start somewhere. And we offer the soul winning times. They're printed in the bulletin. We always have soul winning times at those appointed times. But we also go out on other occasions too. I am willing to be flexible and to work with anybody in this church that if you have a desire, if you are willing to do something, if you are willing to put forth the effort and, and make yourself be used of God in this way, I will do whatever I can. I will speak I will, or, or hook you up with someone else that will do the talking so you can be a silent partner and you can learn these things and you can be used of God. Don't make excuses. Turn, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. I covered one of the excuses already, kind of using myself as an example, an excuse of, well, I'm kind of shy or you know, I'm introverted. That's not the way I am. And in your mind, yeah, you have to overcome that. You have to decide what's more important, your, your feeling of security or your faith in God and, your, and, and, and trusting in, in what God said he actually wants you to do. But another, another excuse that people will make is that I'm too busy. Too busy. I got too much stuff going on. Okay? Now, I, I would like to use myself for an example of this as well. But we have scripture that's even better than my example. Okay, my example, I'm married. I've got five children. I have a full-time job. I pastor this church. And I go out soul winning. Okay? Tell me you got a full-time job. I do too. Tell me you got a family. I do too. Okay? Priorities. What is important to you? What are you going to make sure gets done in any given day or in any given week? 
What do you what do you put up at the top? Those are things you may I make sure my kids get fed. That's pretty important to me. You know what else is important to me? I make sure I'm in church. I make sure that I show up. I make sure that I go out. You know what? Sometimes, obviously, you can get sick. You have other things that, that are, I mean, they come up that will prevent you from doing all manner of things, right? If I get sick, I don't go to work. I have a hard time feed, <laughs> even feeding my family. You know, if I'm really sick, I won't come to church. You know, whatever. But that's, those are rare instances. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about just the excuse to never show up, to never do anything. We see the example was set forth through the Apostle Paul. Also, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 8, the Bible says, So being affectionately desirous of you, and you can see their love for these people, for the lost, for lost souls, being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, so not just love you enough to preach you the gospel, but also our own souls because you were dear unto us. They were pouring out of themselves unto these people. Verse number nine, for ye remember, brethren, and this is how they proved their love. This is how they proved that they were willing to give of their own souls because you can't just see that if they're not doing anything, right? How is it that you can express, man, we were willing to pour out our own souls for you guys. They can see that they preached the gospel unto them because they opened up their mouth and did it. But how did they know that they were willing to just pour out their souls for them and that they were dear to us? Why? He explains in verse number nine. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail. For laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Why? Because they didn't take anything from them. They weren't chargeable. So they didn't say, hey, we're preaching the gospel. We're spending all of our time in the day preaching the gospel. So you need to help us out, give us some food. And he said, no, you know what we did? So that you wouldn't be charged at all. So that this all came completely free of charge. You know what we did? We labored night and day. We worked with our hands. We made sure that all of our needs were met. And then we came and we also preached the gospel to you. The apostle Paul worked hard and preached the gospel at the same time. That's the example. That's the biblical example that we have. And you can see that multiple times in Scripture where, where he's saying things similar. Read 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. It's in both. The Apostle Paul proved you can work and support yourself financially and preach the gospel, but it's up to you to make that decision. Turn, if you would, last place I'm going to have you turn. Turn, if you would, to 1st John chapter 3. 1st John chapter 3, we're all the way near the end of the Bible. 1 John chapter number 3. Because you know what this sermon is about? This sermon really is about love. This is a sermon on love. For, for everyone that's sick and tired of the preaching on sin and the hard preaching, hey, this is a sermon on love. You need to love more. You say, well, I love a lot of people. I have a lot of love for people. I don't care how many cards you send to people, thank you cards, get well cards, or how many cakes you bake, or anything that you might do that makes other people think you're a loving person in the, in, in the world's eyes. If you don't give the gospel to the lost, you're not a loving person. You're not. Not in my eyes. I, I don't think, any, any believer, anybody who's a believer in Jesus Christ who has the free gift of eternal life that never tells anyone else how to go to heaven and lets those people go to hell because they didn't just open their mouth and share with them how to be saved, that is not a loving person at all. You don't love people. You don't love your friends. You don't love your family when you do not tell them how they can go to heaven and have eternal life forever. What does it profit? You can say all day long that you love your family. You can say it. But what does it profit? How much do you really love someone if you withhold the information from them that can get them saved? And, and you know what? That's the way that we need to be looking at this. 
get over yourself and your fears and whatever it is you're because you, what is fear people fear well they're gonna not want to talk to me if i bring up jesus if i bring up the bible they're not gonna have anything to do with me but maybe they will right don't make up their mind for them let them make up their mind and besides if you try to give someone the gospel and they have nothing more to say to you you still love them enough to tell them how to be saved on the flip side if you say well they'll never talk to me again if i bring up jesus and then you never bring up jesus and they die to go to hell is that did you really gain anything i mean what what did you really gain they're burning in hell and you didn't even try and you don't even know if maybe they would have listened to you because maybe you're the one person that they act a certain way to everyone else but for whatever reason, they respect you, they, they connect with you, that if you were to say something, maybe coming from you, God's word, would mean something different to them. Maybe. How do you know that? Unless you try. How do you know? You, you have no way. Don't make up other unbelievers' minds up for them. Let them make the decision for themselves. Love them enough to give them the gospel. 1 John chapter 3, verse number 16. The Bible says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother hath need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? And again, this is, this is going back to that same concept of James 2. He's saying, look, if you've got the, the world's good, if you, if, if you have some money, and like your brother is in need, and you just don't do anything to help them out, you just shut up your bowels of compassion, he said, how dwells the love of God in you? God loved us who didn't, weren't deserving of his love and provided for us and gave us the gift of his only begotten son for us. How, how could you say that the, the love of God dwells in you when you can't even help with like, you know, basically some of the smallest of matters? Verse number 18, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. It's not enough just to say the things. It's not enough to say you believe. It's not enough to say this stuff. Let's love in deed and in truth. With actions. That's what a deed is. You're doing something. People should know that you're a believer in Jesus Christ based on what you do. Not just based on what you say. And hereby know we that we are of the truth, verse number 19, and shall assure our hearts before him, for if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. This is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of the Son of Jesus Christ and love one another. Well, I'm guessing that everyone here already believes on the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. But what about that other part of that, and love one another? Let's demonstrate our love to people by, by lovingly going to their house, not requiring them to come here. Let's go out to them. Let's bring God's word. Let's bring the truth. And let's just try to show them, hey, you could receive a free gift today. Eternal life. What a blessing. Go out. Love your neighbor as yourself. Warn them. You think about what, what do people do sometimes? That, this is the last point and we're done. Just to put things in perspective. Sometimes people, when they see a friend or a family member, they're really bad into drugs or into alcohol, right? What do, what do they set up sometimes? It's called an intervention. They want to intervene in their life. And what is the motivation behind that? They love that person, right? They don't want to stand by and just stand back and not say anything because their friend, their loved one, is, make, is going down a bad path. And they can see the road. The person that's on that path, they don't know necessarily that they're on a path of destruction. 
They don't see the end just being as terrible as it is, which is why you have the friends and family that want to intervene and shake them and say, hey, we love you, but if you keep going this way, you will be destroyed. It is not going to end well for you. So, hey, why don't you change? Why don't you get on the right path? People are willing to do that when they see the drugs and when they see the alcohol. People are willing to overcome their fears. People are willing to maybe overstep their boundaries or bring up something that's a little bit uncomfortable because they see the end result and they care about that person enough to do so. They love them enough to do something about it. Why can't we see that the, the, the unbeliever path is headed towards destruction and hell and misery and torture and pain and that is not the path that we want them to be on so let's have an intervention with that person. Let's love them enough and care about, hey, where your end result is going to be is not good. Get on the right path. You need to change. You need to put your faith in Jesus Christ. That's what you need to be saved. And then we could be comfortable, no, just as you could be comfortable, oh, the addict has given up all this stuff and they're, they're, they're done being an addict and, and now their path seems to be going well. Well, people will be more comfortable with that, right? You're, you're going you're gonna to feel your job was done. Well, when you can show somebody the gospel and they can put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, hey, at least you could know that person's going to be in heaven. They're, they're, they're going to be with me in, for eternity. We need to keep everything in perspective. Keep our lives in perspective. What we do in perspective. The amount of time we spend doing the things we do in perspective. We've got the soul winning challenge. I hope everyone participates in this. This is probably, the, I would say, probably the hardest one. I know it's the hardest one for me just because, like I said before, I'm not always out. But you know what? You can make a phone call to somebody. You can, you know, just anybody. You be driving on the street. You see someone walk. I've done this before too. I see someone walking on the street. I'll go and park my car up down the road and I'll start walking on the sidewalk the other way. Hey, how's it going? Hey, can you guys? That's it. It's all it takes. Okay, it's not much. Be willing to invest five minutes of your day to 30 minutes. I mean, hopefully if someone listens to you to be able to give them the gospel, whatever, however long it's going to take you to, to walk through that with them. And if you don't, if you've never given the gospel before and you don't even know what to say, you could still participate in this. You could still approach people. And what we have, we have back there, we have gospel tracts, we have invitations to our church. At the very minimum, here's what I, if, if you've never tried to give someone the gospel before, here's what you can do, okay? In addition to like maybe being a silent partner with someone else, here's what you can do even on your own. Take our invitation, invite someone to our church, but show them on the back because there's a Bible way to heaven is on there with some Bible verses and, and, and read those out to them and point that out to them, Okay? And, you're, and to the best of your ability, just explain how they can be saved using those verses on the back. So everyone can participate in this. It's, even if you've never done it before, if you at least just do that, if you say, hey, can I just show you this real quick? And explain that, that Bible way to heaven to them. It, I believe there's five verses on there. And that's it. And as with all of our challenges, there's a prize that you can win. So if, you, if, you're, if you're more concerned about the temporal than you are about the eternal, right? We've, we've, got, we've got the temporal prizes that, that we give. And the, the month-long challenges, when you complete these, there are significant prizes. So like the Bible reading one, usually we give like a really nice Bible, leather bound, you know, all the, 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 the nice frills on them. And we've got plenty of other things. We've got special DVD sets or whatever. We've got all kinds of things that we give away for prizes. So um, hopefully you'll, you'll do this. And uh, month of February, I, I picked the shortest month of the year. February has the least amount of days in it. So that, that gives you a little bit more, you know, it's a little bit easier for you. It's a, it's a light affliction. But let's, uh, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the love that you've bestowed upon us. God, we thank you for loving us so much that you were willing to, to sacrifice your only begotten son to pay the debt that we rightfully owe to you, dear Lord. And um, 
We thank you for that wonderful gift, and I pray that you would please stir up our spirits to want to share that great news, that great gift with others, with, with people who are, who are blinded by the world, who are blinded by Satan, dear Lord, and I pray that you please help us to, to boldly go forth and to shine the glorious light of the gospel so that it could penetrate to their, to their soul and to their heart, dear Lord, and um, I pray that you would please use us, help us to, to, to have more laborers and that we would be able to just reach more people and, and show, show people your love and, and how much you want them to be saved, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.